Well, one way of perhaps understanding what's happening there is to look at computers again, because something rather similar, some very fast evolution seems to have happened with the computer. And here's a dramatic quotation to illustrate that from a psychologist called Christopher Evans. Here's what he said. Today's car differs from those of the immediate post-war years on a number of counts. It is cheaper, allowing for the ravages of inflation, and it's more economical and efficient. All this can be put down to advances in automobile engineering, more efficient methods of production, and a wider market. But suppose for a moment that the automobile industry had developed at the same rate as computers and over the same period, how much cheaper and more efficient would the current models be? If you have not already heard the analogy, the answer is shattering. Today, you would be able to buy a Rolls Royce for £1.35, it would do three million miles to the gallon, and it would deliver enough power to drive the Queen Elizabeth II. And if you were interested in miniaturization, you could place half a dozen of them on a pinhead. So if the human brain has blown up like a balloon, it looks as though the computer has advanced even more spectacularly. Although, of course, it's rather unfair to compare the timescales directly, because the evolutionary timescale is limited by the fact that in order for evolution to happen, people have got to die, generation after generation, and other people have got to reproduce. It ne necessarily takes a lot longer than technology, which happens, which can advance all the time. Nobody knows for certain what it was that caused the ballooning of the human brain. There are lots of theories, but as I said, perhaps we can get a clue from computers. If we look at what it is that's made them develop so fast, improve so fast, it might help us to guess why our brains have too. Well, there are lots of differences between computers and brains. Lots of things won't help us. It's no good looking at, for example, the improvement from valves to transistors to integrated circuits, because brains don't work like that anyway. But there is one source of computer advancement, one thing that's been going on in the development of the computer, which just might give us a clue about what happened with the brain. I'm going to give it a long name, and you'll see what it means later. I'm going to call it self-feeding coevolution. Coevolution just means evolving together. Self-feeding is the name I'm going to give to any process in which the more you have, the more you get. Think about the arms race, for instance. As the missiles on one side in the arms race get bigger and better and faster, so the interceptor devices on the other side, the radars and counter-missiles, have to get better and faster and more accurate as well. And when they've got better, then the missiles on the first side have to get better still. And so the radars and interceptors have to get better still. And the process escalates indefinitely, like that. I call it self-feeding, because there is a sense in which improvements in the original radars directly necessitate later improvements in the same radar, even though it's going via the loop of making the radars on the other side get, get better. So the more you have, the more you need, the more you get. Arms races happen in evolution as well. Here's a peregrine falcon, which is flying along, beautiful piece of flying machinery, and soon it's going to see some prey, which it's going to dive to attack. Here it is, the wings go in, it screams down at nearly 100 miles an hour on its prey, which in this case happens to be a duck, also flying very, very fast. The duck's flying fast, there it comes. <laughs> Both the duck and the hawk are end products of a long evolutionary arms race. Both of them are extremely good at flying, and the reason is that the other one is. In their ancestry, improvements on one side necessitated improvements on the other. As hawks got better, ducks had to get better. And as ducks got better, hawks had to get better. So indirectly, it's, it was the improvements in the hawks that made their descendants have to get even better later. And improvements in the ducks made their descendants have to get even better later. That's why I call it self-feeding. Now what this is all leading up to is that something like that self-feeding coevolution co may have gone on in the development of computers and more importantly, brains. In computers, both hardware and software 
co-evolve. Hardware means the, the physical bits like this, things you can touch and feel. Software means programs, and improvements in both are important. Here's a very simple piece of hardware, the mouse. It's just a ball and socket, ball there in, in a socket. And as you move it around, you see a little pointer moving around on the screen. And this gives you a very, very powerful illusion. You almost feel as though your hand is in there moving things around the screen. It's a natural thing to do. In the bad old days of computing, if you wanted to do something like throw away uh, a file, then you had to go to the keyboard and you had to type some ridiculous rigmarole like delete, miter, baslib, codswood, text, all sorts of stuff like that. If you made a mistake, you had to correct it, and you usually did make a mistake. You nearly always forgot what the command was anyway. Nowadays, all you have to do, if you, have, if you want a throwaway comment, is just pick it up, move it to the waste paper basket, and let go. Now we have to empty the waste paper basket, which you see is bulged, and agree to let it go, and it goes. That's just a trivial example. What's much more important is that the modern computer world is entirely dominated by using a mouse or using some kind of pointing device to quickly move things around, do things very, very naturally, as though you were moving bits of paper around on your desktop. Pick things up, move them around, make them appear, make Menu, menus appear and so on, like that. It's all now very easy, where once upon a time you would have had to remember di difficult rigmaroles to type. Now, the, the reason for bringing this, this up is that it was all triggered by an original, very simple hardware device. That in itself is trivial, there's nothing much to it, it's very easy. But what it spawned was a whole new generation of software and software building upon other software building upon other software and so you build up a complete edifice of mutually working co-evolving software another example of computers getting into a self-feeding spiral is the way c computers themselves are designed modern computers are far too complicated to be designed in detail by humans this chart here is one-eighth of the circuit diagram of this chip here. So that is one computer chip, and the circuit diagram for that computer chip is eight times as big as what you see here. Now let's just walk around this a little bit. Each of these red marks here is one wire following them up round here. Let's follow these main trunks round here. Let your eye roam over this remarkable document and realize that no human could really sit down and design that. A human has the basic ideas, a human programs the computer to do it, but modern computers are very largely designed by the previous generation of computers. Modern computers are piggybacking on the back of an earlier generation of computers. Once again, we have an example of a self-feeding spiral. Early advances lead into later advances, and they go into a spiral. Well, we've seen self-feeding coevolution in the computer, and the purpose of that, of course, was to develop an analogy with the human brain. Can we see the something like the same thing going on in the human brain? Well, unfortunately, unlike computers, we can't look directly at the intermediates. All that we have by way of evidence is skulls and, to a limited extent, skills. We have the outer casings, and we have, in the, by way of software, we have the products, which is things like flint arrowheads produced by uh, our, our ancestors, and we have pictures like these two bison here, a cave painting. This is a relic of the product of an early human brain. And we have, much later, of course, we have writings like this cuneiform tablet or like this book. <laughs>